further ado, I would like to introduce you to Istro CERT. Um, if by any chance you're wondering what the name of our company as well as the name of our team means, uh, here we go. Istros is the ancient Greek name for the river Danube. And as we are based in Bratislava, Slovakia, the river is a symbol that we chose as the base of our name. So quite simple. Here is our entry in the TI database. Uh, we are currently listed in the T TI, uh, but uh, we look forward to become accredited and also to become a member of FIRST very soon. Uh, the company was established sometime before summer 2021 and the CSER team was established shortly after. Uh, and our constituency consists of uh, institutions uh, that signed an agreement with us. So basically our clients, as well as uh, the customer base of our products. We are an ethical company that conducts its business uh, activities honestly, apolitically, directly and fairly to all parties involved. Uh, if you would like to read more on our mission statement, you can do so on our website, istrosec.com. We offer a full array of cybersecurity services, but a part of that, we also focus on research and development. Uh, we uh, offer proactive, reactive, offensive, and also defensive services. We have a DFIR department, uh, managed defense department, offensive security department, and advisory department. These are uh, responsible for their respective services, of course. Um, we have incident response, uh, digital forensics, malware analysis, and threat hunting services. Also, we offer uh, outsourced CSERT services and also uh, an assessment that we call uh, incident preparedness, where we assess um, whether our clients uh, have uh, adequate processes and technology in place for swift and effective reaction. Our offensive department uh, also has their offensive services uh, ranging from uh, vulnerability assessments through pen tests, uh, red teaming and purple teaming, also attack simulations, phishing, uh, spear phishing, whaling, also uh, developing custom scenarios and custom malware uh, that can be used in these simulations. Uh, we also serve as a security operations uh, center level three and four. We deploy EDR, a CM and SOAR solutions at our client's infrastructure and we manage it for them. Uh, we also have a defensive intelligence where we uh, analyze, search and analyze for data leaks from dark web, deep web, uh, also uh, advisory services, uh, audits uh, and also implementations of various cybersecurity frameworks. Uh, we also offer a virtual CISO, uh, technical audits uh, and hardening of infrastructure. Last well, but not least, uh, we also offer trainings and exercises, uh, also trainings for uh, personnel, uh, specialized uh, IT professionals, uh, trainings uh, and management trainings, and also tabletop uh, exercises and cybersecurity drills. Our team has some uh, achievements. Uh, we found multiple vulnerabilities in operating systems, uh, IT and OT systems. Currently we have 10 assigned CVEs, 15 more are currently in process. Four members of our team were part of a winning team of Lock Shields exercise back in the day. Uh, we are also authors and co-authors of multiple research topics uh, where we presented them in various conferences like DEF CON, uh, Black Hat, Cybercrime CON, as well as TFC CERT. Uh, we are authors and co-authors of multiple cybersecurity tools like Gargamel, Ransomware Vaccine, IOC Checker, Asset, Log Parser. Uh, our experience uh, uh, is quite big. Uh, we had multiple instant response and cyber defense engagements. We performed more than 300 instant response forensic engagements uh, against 13 APTs. Uh, we were doing penetration testing and red teaming engagements for Fortune 500 companies, governmental institutions, and nonprofits, and uh, also 20, uh, 240 red teaming and penetration test engagement engagements. I'm sorry. Uh, these are our certificates. Uh, and uh, I hope I did it in time. If you have any questions, uh, please uh, shoot me a message in the chat and I will get back to them. Thank you very much.
Very good. Well, um, by day, I direct um, response to detections and crowd strikes, machine learning, uh, and data science organization. But um, my my volunteer work is I'm part of the CBE board, and I am the chairperson of the outreach working group. Thanks very much for having me. And um, one of the areas that we most uh, want to grow and are growing a great deal is in Europe. So I'm, I appreciate the opportunity to be here bright and early this morning. Thank you. Uh, most of you know very well, uh, oops, too many slides there. Sorry, most of you know very well what CBE is uh, and that our program's mission is to uh, catalog cybersecurity vulnerabilities. I don't know if everyone knows very well that CVE is a very international community and that we um, are not MITRE. Uh, MITRE is the secretariat of CVE uh, and we do receive sponsorship from um, Homeland Security in the United States, but we are um, driven by community, driven by membership, decisions made by the board. Um, and we want um, greater global participation and we want to enable greater global participation. Um, of course, we do allow people to uh, be able to refer to a vulnerability and know that they're talking about uh, the same thing. So um, CBE is to give us a, a language and a tool to talk about it. Oh. Community, um, again, we, Gosh, sorry, touchy thing. Again, we are a community-driven program. Uh, we rely on the community, vendors, end users, uh, vulnerability researchers. Um, CBEs are assigned by the CBE numbering authorities, which are sometimes uh, the software vendor, but are sometimes a uh, bug bounty, sometimes individual researchers, sometimes um, a country cert. So CNAs um, drive the assignment. The CBE board, again, provides the direction of the program. Um, and the board does consist of industry professionals, academics, government representatives, uh, persons from around the world. Um, the working groups develop the program's policies, uh, which again are approved by the board. And uh, many of the working groups some are only open to the CNA membership and some are open to the general community. Uh, my own working group, the outreach working group is one of those open to the general community. Uh, so again, I think you know very well, you know, what is a CVE? Um, but this is uh, the information that we're trying to provide and the language that we're that we're trying to um, keep everyone you know, on the same page so that we do have greater means to talk about critical vulnerabilities, right? Um, so how does it work? Again, I think this group knows very well, a discoverer, a researcher discovers a new vulnerability, they report it to um, a CVE program participant, uh, to the vendor, to the CNA, what have you. Uh, they request a CVE identifier. The CVE ID is now reserved. Um, the pro CVE program participant submits the details and we publish, um, and these are republished around the world, of course. Uh, so what's a CNA? Um, and this is really my pitch, if you will, is a greater CNA engagement. And I think many of you may be CNAs already. Some of you are not. Uh, but what's a CNA, an organization responsible for the assignment of CVE IDs? Again, this may be a software vendor, uh, maybe an open source project, maybe a country coordination center, could be a bug bounty, could be a research organization, could be a hosted service. I think um, when you become a CNA, you demonstrate a mature vulnerability uh, management processes and practices. You communicate value-added vulnerability information. You control your message uh, about vulnerabilities within your scope. Um, you can assign a CVE ID without having to share embargoed information. 
Um, you can share information more broadly to protect systems against attacks. Um, and you have the opportunity to exchange ideas in partnership with other CNA organizations, which is the community aspect, right? Um, I think sometimes people think the bar for becoming a CNA must be uh, very high. Um, and sometimes organizations think, oh, I'm, I'm not ready for that. Uh, but really, uh, the bar is quite simple. Um, and we're here uh, as a community to help promote enablement. Um, have a public vulnerability disclosure policy, uh, have a public source uh, for new vulnerability disclosures, and agree to the CVE terms of use. Uh, there is no monetary requirement, there's no contract you have to sign, and CNAs volunteer their own time for their own benefit. Um, so to become a CNA, you would contact the CBE program, you'd complete the registration form, agree to the terms of use, attend an introductory session. Again, uh, we are about enablement of participation. We do have videos online um, available at all hours uh, to assist with enablement. Um, successfully complete with us some practice examples so we can um, ensure that everybody is on the same page. Um, I had an organization recently that was like, oh gosh, there's a test. It's really quite simple. Um, and again, you know, we're here to help. So um, there are uh, 212 CNAs in 33 countries. Uh, we are working on our, our global um, reach. And, and thank you so much for having me today at First Europe. Um, and that's it from me. That's my pitch. And if you'd like to get involved, please contact me. I'm Shannon Sabins at CrowdStrike.com. And I'd love to help you. Um, I'd love to facilitate your involvement. Thank you. So uh, I have this great privilege to, to uh, shortly introduce uh, ourselves. This is our first time uh, as a new joiners, newbies in, in the organization. So Atos, Atos is quite a big company with uh, many business from IT. We, we represent the Atos cybersecurity department, the Atos cybersecurity part. As you can see in the numbers, uh, many impressive, uh, impressive numbers, but uh, what we are really proud of uh, is the fact that we have over 6K uh, plus security professionals just oriented on many aspects of, of, of uh, cybersecurity. Uh, our ambition is to, to grow, to, to be the, um, the, the, the leader in the cybersecurity uh, and to support our customer with this competence, with, this, uh, with the skills that our people present on technology and on, 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 um, on skills that pro professional uh, competences uh, aspects. Uh, but we are also here because we are CERT, we are CERT, so Atos CERT. Um, it means that we have over 20 customers uh, supporting worldwide, uh, 60 plus uh, CERT members, uh, uh, roughly, uh, uh, roughly around 200 incidents per year, processed uh, from less severe to, to the criticals. But uh, not only numbers, CSERT, uh, CSERT or the Atos CERT uh, combines from, uh, <coughs> combines of, sorry, <coughs> combines of uh, incident response of digital forensics and malware analysis, the core, um, the core uh, of uh, CSERT team. Uh, we have also product uh, CSERT, uh, we have threat intelligence, threat hunting and vulnerability management. Like we said yesterday, that's the part of the blue team on the on the on the right side on the on the red team <laughs> on the dark side of uh, of energy we have our red team who constantly uh, constantly um, stimulate us uh, to improve ourselves uh, and yeah we have worldwide presence in terms of having customers uh, international on many uh, on uh, on each continent but also. Uh, worldwide presence, it means that we have global CSERT, but we have also local uh, presence of our CSERTs to support uh, local needs of our customers. Uh, and that's it. We are really, really honored to, to be here, to, to be part of the first and really enjoy uh, and looking forward to support this, this community. 
uh, again, like we emphasized yesterday, stronger together. Uh, here's the contact uh, uh, to us. So any questions, any uh, any need to contact, go ahead. We are well, you are well to welcome to more than welcome to 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 the discussion. Us. That's all for my side. So now uh, you can see my uh, slides. So I will present uh, our malware analysis sharing platform, which we developed at uh, CCTMU in the uh, Sapan Horizon 2020 uh, project. And to uh, jump uh, right in, I will uh, start uh, and to describe uh, how the uh, process works. Uh, so at start, our goal is to uh, evaluate uh, whether a uh, suspicious file is uh, malicious or not. And to uh, help us with this, uh, our architecture offers a uh, web UI uh, where the analyst uploads uh, the suspicious file. And uh, from this point, everything is automated. So the uh, file is uh, persistently stored in S3 uh, data storage, uh, which is continuously uh, monitored by Apache Airflow process. Uh, which uh, monitors uh, the S3 buckets for uh, any new files. And uh, if a new sample is found, uh, it uh, sends it uh, to the observable evaluator, uh, which is a, a tool uh, that we developed to evaluate the files. Uh, it uh, utilizes uh, Intel OWL uh, platform, uh, which uh, sends the file to uh, multiple uh, third-party tools. Uh, you can see examples of the tools at the uh, right side uh, on the pictures. Uh, I think everybody here knows uh, VirusTotal, uh, Hybrid Analysis, Alien Vault, OTX, and uh, many others. And Martin, uh, just Martin, just I'm only seeing I'm seeing like the presenters view. I'm not seeing. I've only seen. You know, it's only on the first slide at the moment. Oh. So maybe uh, like this. Yeah, well, I'm seeing the architecture now, yes. Yeah. Uh, so uh, this is the uh, web UI, S3, uh, data bucket, Apache Airflow, server evaluator, Intel OWL. Uh, everything is uh, automated. So uh, the file uh, goes to the third party tools, uh, which uh, returns a uh, report. Uh, whether the uh, file is uh, malicious or not, and uh, also uh, returns uh, IOC indicators of compromise, uh, which means uh, we can check uh, the IP addresses or uh, domain names uh, with which the uh, sample communicates. And uh, for each IOC, we uh, recursively uh, run the analysis through uh, those uh, uh, third party tools uh, to evaluate the uh, IOCs as well. Uh, when all of this is uh, done, we return the results to Apache Airflow, uh, which uh, prepares a, a PDF report uh, back to the human analysts and also prepares the uh, same uh, data to the MISC sharing platform uh, so that it could be uh, shared with uh, other teams. Uh, the last step is uh, the mitigation of uh, malicious IOCs where we uh, prepared API uh, to uh, automatically block uh, the malicious IP addresses or domains. Uh, so uh, for development, uh, we uh, prepared everything in uh, Docker so that it could be uh, deployed uh, using uh, one command. Uh, the uh, only thing that uh, we uh, have to provide is the API keys uh, for the third party tools because uh, they uh, required uh, you to have uh, uh, user account, even though it's uh, free, uh, you need to provide uh, this API. Uh, so uh, to take a look at uh, how uh, this works, uh, at first the Apache Airflow uh, monitors everything, uh, then the analysts uh, submits the suspicious file into the web UI, uh, just a simple uh, web page, uh, then the analysis uh, process starts, so uh, we can see uh, the guts of Apache Airflow. And uh, when everything is done inside, uh, the analysts can uh, download uh, the created report, uh, which contains the final result, uh, whether the file is malicious or not. It provides the hashes, all known uh, variants, and uh, which of the third party tools uh, detected as uh, malicious and uh, which tools uh, didn't. 
And the uh, next page of the PDF report, uh, the analysts can uh, look at the uh, indicators of compromise. So we can see our uh, sample malware communicates with uh, four IP addresses. Uh, three of them are uh, tagged by uh, alien vault as malicious, uh, one is not, and uh, the same data in MISP. So uh, that was my uh, short intro of the platform. Uh, currently, uh, it's a work in progress in the uh, SAPAN project, which will end in April. So at the end of the uh, project, in about one month, uh, we will release this as open source on GitHub. Uh, so it will be available for everybody. Uh, so far, if you are interested, uh, just send us an email and uh, we will provide you access. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, it's great to be here with you. Great to see you all again. Hopefully we'll see each other soon in person. What I have for you today are 10 slides for five minutes about Lock4Shell. Before I jump in, bit of context. Up until the end of January, I used to lead an incident response team at Aleph a mid-European organization that um, basically offers services related to cybersecurity. Before I left the team, I took a look at our captures on IPS related to Log4Shell. And I noticed a couple of interesting trends that I thought would be worth it to share with you within the context of this lightning talk. So let's jump right in. You probably all know what Log4J is and Log4Shell is, but for everyone who has been sleeping for the past year. Log4j is an incredible logging framework. Basically what Apache did with it is to enable us to log anything in basically any format, to interact with additional services on the back end after things are logged. Basically you can do anything with it. It's wonderful. Unfortunately, all these features come at the cost of complexity. And complexity, as we all very well know, can be fairly opposed to security, which is where our unfriendly lock for shell or CVE 2021-44-228 came in. It was one of those rare vulnerabilities that are CVSS 10.0. Currently, most of the critical ones are 9.8, but this was a pure 10. As in, you basically have to look at a vulnerable server and you have complete control over it. This was a problem because the exploitation was very easy. And how attackers usually respond to these uh, announcements and to these vulnerabilities, they basically decided to exploit it as soon as possible. Unfortunately, when I say it, as in Log4j was widely used, I am not speaking in any metaphors, I'm not oversimplifying. Basically, it meant that hundreds of thousands, if not millions of applications were vulnerable because of Log4j vulnerability. Uh, Google did a fairly interesting search over Maven, which is one of the large Java and Java package repositories. And they discovered that about 8% of all libraries in the repository were vulnerable, were affected by Log4Shell. Why is this surprising? Well, you wouldn't think that so many libraries and so many applications use Log4J, and they don't by themselves. But as we all very well know, one library usually uses other libraries and those use another libraries and so on and so forth. So as you may see on the chart in front of you, this is what Google came up with. Actually, the dependency went to the eighth degree in case of Log4j. So lots of applications, lots of systems vulnerable and we have a CVSS 10.0. Luckily, as soon as the exploitation began, response began as well. And soon after the end of last year, the exploitation attempts seemed to taper off fairly quickly. So that's the basis. That's the background for Log4Shell. 
It was a huge issue. What I want to talk about today fairly quickly are a couple of lessons learned that I noticed could be gained from our IPS or from the PCAPs that were captured by it. Looking at IPS, today we have some generic rules that we all apply, but perhaps taking a look at exploitation attempts for Log4Shell might actually give us some indication of additional rules that we might be able to deploy to actually protect ourselves and our constituencies from similar attacks, at least if the attempts at the exploitations aren't too extreme and if the attackers are lazy which in this case they usually were, luckily for us. Where to start? Well, if you take a look at the exploit strings, which you have on, in front of you, I've taken all of these from our large PCAP for all the time that the exploitation was ongoing. One feature which I've noticed was that the attackers, whether it be through some HTML parameter or through URL, they tried to use fairly standard paths to an exploit or to exploit carrying library. Log4Shell basically enabled them to through LDAP download a Java, li Java library and then run it. So if we take a look at what we have in front of us, well, there is slash exploit in all of the URIs here. None of us ever had, hopefully, on any of our servers, any path or any parameter which uses the word exploit in it. If we do, we are in the minority. So why not block any attempts to actually access slash exploit on our servers? This would protect us. So writing a very simple, Snort rule would actually protect us from this generic attack. It wouldn't have to be just lock for shell it could be anything else. But we don't have to st stop there. Another very generic example, slash base 64. Yes, there are examples where you will have legitimately in an application's path, in a parameter, in URL, the word base 64, but it will be fairly unusual. We can whitelist for those. So if you don't use any such application, blocking any attempt that uses the word base64 in a URL or in a parameter might make sense. Another word that might be interesting might be bypass. I've seen tens of slash Tomcat bypass. The attackers were lazy. They took the default exploit code from some GitHub repository, didn't change a thing, just tried to use it as it was. The last thing I wanted to mention, and it's quite a funny one, what the attackers tried to do was to actually do an LDAP lookup for their own domain, but they prepended the IP address, the public IP address of the vulnerable server or the attacked server. So they would know immediately whether it was vulnerable or not. This is a technique that uh, reasonable researchers use as well, but that shouldn't stop us from actually blocking it. Attackers use it as well, why not stop them? We could go on, but what I wanted to show by these three examples, we don't like block listing. It's not a good practice. We like allow listing, but if we learn from Lock4Shell exploitation attempts, we can see that just by setting up a couple of very simple snort or uh, suricata rules, we might actually have been able to cover quite a large portion of lock 4 shell exploitation attempts. And perhaps these same strings or these same rules could help us in the future as well. I'm sorry if I went a little bit over time, hopefully not very much, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attention. And I wish you a wonderful rest of the day. I'm Christos, and uh, I'm coming from the Sun Computer Security Team. And my goal in the next five minutes uh, is to present the idea of low effort security operation center padding based on the correlation of passive DNS data with threat intelligence. The main motivation for providing this service comes from the fact that building and operating a fully fledged security operation center is extremely difficult for most users. 
Deploying network monitoring plus threat intelligence infrastructure is a serious complex, uh, a serious and complex task. Hence, only a very small fraction of the research and education organizations have a production stock at the moment. It becomes apparent that we have to find a way to lower this entry barrier. So, what are we doing in this direction? So far, we're providing direct support to mature enough institutions to set up SOC platforms and improve their threat intelligence capabilities. We're also working on providing a minimalistic SOC design to smaller and less mature institutions that cannot maintain a fully fledged SOC at the moment. However, both of these points, for various reasons, and especially the latter, have been proven, to develop, have been proven complex to develop and non trivial. Actually, considering those pitfalls, we came up with an alternative approach named PDNS SOC. In this approach, instead of deploying a fully fledged SOC on every institution, only selected mature ones will be hosting central SOCs, while smaller ones will be only deploying PDNS sensors. Those PDNS sensors will be actually providing data to the central uh, mature infrastructures. These data will be then correlated with threat intelligence, producing alerts for malicious traffic ready to be filtered and sent to participating institutions. PDNS SOC consists of parts that can be deployed with multiple approaches and even in different organizations. In fact, in this graph, every color represents an element and a part that can be deployed in a different organization. So now let's assume the most distributed scenario among the deployment scenarios and uh, describe the pipeline from uh, PDNS data collection to uh, end client uh, alerting. PDNS probes are deployed uh, above the recursive for each uh, part, uh, participating lightweight uh, institution. And this is actually the only requirement that we have for institutions to participate in this schema. Data is then pushed from these probes to a PDNS infrastructure service where data preparation and correlation with MISP intelligence uh, takes place. This results in alerts uh, being sent to central security teams for analysis and uh, handling. These teams should then filter uh, the alerts and notify the lightweight, uh, uh, the lightweight institutions regarding the malicious traffic. And the last step is actually the follow-up from the lightweight institutions, so the correlation of the alerts coming from the central security teams with their internal network traffic logs. It is important to note at this point that throughout this pipeline, no personal identifiable information is found. Uh, thus, we maintain the privacy throughout the complete dataset. And this is actually because we only log server to server communication and the PDNS probes are deployed above the recursive, hence only the addresses of the querying name servers are logged. However, it's important to note that this is the not the only way to deploy the stack and we aim for the maximum flexibility and to support alternate modules. So as you, as you can see on the right hand side of uh, this graph, both the infrastructure as well as the alerting elements can be hosted in the same institution, rendering the alert filtering before the actual, the actual client alerts redundant. And finally, for the case of mature enough institutions, the whole stack from PDNS probing to client alerting can be hosted in the same institution. At the moment, we are working on selecting the appropriate PDNS probe, as well as designing the correlation engine between the passive DNS data and the misfit indicators. As this is a project in its infancy, if you want to participate, you're more than welcome and uh, please contact us to the given address. That is actually all by me. I hope I was in time.